Good evening. Welcome to the Midwest Farm Report. I'm Cletus Tashney of Blue Earth County, Minnesota. Tonight I'm going to be visiting with Father John McRae of Milroy, Minnesota. Father was born and raised on a farm here in Minnesota, Hutchison to be exact. Right now he's a rural pastor at Milroy, Minnesota. He is also a director of the National Catholic Rural Life Conference. Father, I wonder if at this time you could uh, give us a little bit of the conference's viewpoints on this farm situation. Well, I think so. The concern that the uh, National Catholic Rural Life Conference has for the family type farming, I think was brought out uh, very well in their last meeting in January, which was uh, held in Kentucky, I believe. And uh, they passed resolutions uh, to the effect that they go on record as doing everything in their power to keep the family uh, type farming that we have today. And I think this has always been their concern that uh, we do not go into a corporate uh, type agriculture. They've brought this out over and over again, that this is not a very satisfactory answer to our problems and that uh, they would uh, certainly uh, favor a family uh, type farming as we, as we know it in this part of our mm -hmm. country. And they made no bones about the fact that they were disappointed in the present administration's attempts uh, parent attempts anyway to uh, do something about getting rid of uh, a little over two-thirds of the farmers that we have. They seem to think that one-third could do the job nicely, which would, I don't know what two-thirds they're going to pick out, whether it'll be you or who, but they'll, uh, they seem to think that we can do real well without them. And this, the conference field, is not even a, a sensible answer from an economic point of view. Uh, but these are real people with real problems and uh, people who uh, have feelings and have desires and who have uh, a desire to farm and, uh, and, and have their roots in agriculture. And it's not that simple that you can just pick them up and transplant them, that, uh, to say nothing about the doing away of a whole way of life. So I think they're, they're real definite in favor of the family's farm. Well, I would just uh, met Father for the first time this evening and uh, we were talking for a few minutes uh, before we went on the program here. Father, I know you have some definite ideas about uh, this uh, agricultural situation, and uh, I'm not going to take up too much of the time leading up to it. I'd rather give you a chance to talk a little bit about it, Father. Uh, would you care to... Uh, I enjoyed this illustration you gave me right off the bat, and uh, I'd hope that you'd include that in your observation. Well, I think that if you're, if you're asking what uh, agriculture, what it looks like, from my point of view anyway, I think an illustration that uh, shows this probably as well as anything uh, would be that of a lot of men being hanged. And uh, to my estimation, uh, agriculture or farmers are being hanged and small town businessmen, they certainly are definitely included in this. And of course we know that even though we haven't been uh, and lately, we know that this uh, is a probably a very painless process until we get to the end of the rope, and then suddenly something has happened. We've done something wrong. There's been a mistake. And uh, I'd like to picture this then, uh, everyone with a varying length of rope. Some people have come to the end of it. Uh, you know them, I know them, uh, in the last year, two years, five years. Uh, some are starting to uh, reach the end now. Some have very long ropes uh, due to uh, financial helps, perhaps having farmed during the good years, so-called good years during the war and immediately after the war, uh, through inheritance or whatever, they have put together a <coughs> large amount of money and actually are living very well. There's no doubt about this. But in my mind, the day will come uh, if something isn't done when they too will reach the end of their rope. And the amazing thing to me is the lack of concern that we have as rural people for one another, almost to the point where when someone does reach the end of his rope uh, and uh, is financially broke, and we almost laugh and say, well, there was a poor manager, you know, uh, 
or he did this or he did that wrong, uh, too bad. I wonder if I can get a chance to rent his farm. This is our main concern, if I could possibly be included in, uh, uh, into getting a little bigger and, and, and included into, in, in the divide up that uh, property. And so this is, the, this is the picture. I think another one that illustrates this uh, idea also is the fact that we live in a sick industry. Now, there are undoubtedly farmers who are doing rather well in the sense that they're making a good living. Uh, perhaps uh, if they were to figure out the investment and their return, according to government statistics anyway, it's just not there. But with a large enough capital, you can make a good living. Uh, these people say everything is fine, that, uh, but the industry is sick. And if there's sickness all around me, I have every reason in the world to believe that it'll, it'll get to me in time. I, I like to think of the days when uh, uh, we got the polio vaccine, and perhaps uh, someone were uh, asked if they didn't want the uh, shots, and this man might say, well, I, I don't have polio. We've never had it in our family. We're healthy. My uh, children are healthy and strong. I am. There's no reason for it. And you'd say, well, no, but the disease is around you. you you're going to, in time, it's going to affect you, perhaps. Why take that chance? And uh, so the lack of concern that it can't happen to me but it has happened, it is happening to, to real people. And this is kind of the picture that I get uh, from my going about uh, amongst farm people. It's, uh, it's, re it's a real challenge visiting with these farm people and finding out the difference as you go down the road from one to the next. Uh, what uh, reasons he may have for the situation being as it is. It's surprising that there could be as much difference between, uh, between uh, different members of this occupation uh, about how they figure out uh, their problems. Uh, I got a kick out of this uh, little story you were telling about uh, visiting with this family and the <laughs> subject of the milk holding action or the price of milk came up. Well, this, this <laughs> came up, this happened a year ago when the, when the cost of milk went up in the uh, at the retail end and uh, had not uh, gone up to the farmer, at least not very much. And I was bemoaning this fact to a uh, table uh, where I had been invited to a family. And uh, there was a nine-year-old lad there. They're not a farm family at all. As a matter of fact, the father is uh, coaches is a, and in education. And uh, the lad listened for a little while as I uh, talked about this. And finally, uh, not... Uh, in any sense of authority, but he said, well then, why don't those farmers just keep their milk till they get a price? And uh, this struck me that a, that a nine-year-old boy would uh, answer this, uh, or would uh, seem to see the answer to this problem, and uh, so many of the rest of us have difficulties. Yeah, it's, it's, it's troublesome for some of us to really to figure out the answer. To realize. Yes. Yeah. What do you think uh, we will definitely have to do, Father, to uh, right this situation, to remedy it? Well, I think the, the answer uh, perhaps lies in two areas, for sure, and in a third, possibly, but in two areas. Uh, the first one being that we do have to have legislation. Uh, we, can't, we can't just run roughshod over Washington and say we don't need them. I'm convinced more and more that every industry has to be protected with laws uh, from uh, uh, one another and from other groups and so on. Uh, this is not uh, unheard of. In fact, it's done. And agriculture will need, certainly need this kind of protection. So we need Washington to give us the kind of legislation that will protect agriculture. That's the first part of it. And the second part would be the answer that came from an old man some years ago in a letter to the Christian people of the world, moderate magister, the, uh, coming from Pope John. I think someone who was loved perhaps by the whole world. And uh, he himself, from a rural background, we used to enjoy seeing his family and their, uh, who were on the land, farmers, uh, coming to see the Holy Father and so on. But agriculture uh, has difficulties all over the world. And I'm sure that uh, Pope John realized this, his own family suffering perhaps from it uh, somewhat. And uh, 
The answer that he gave was that of collective bargaining, and I think this has been uh, talked about throughout the church and throughout the United States many times over. But it, it is a fact that he uh, asked for or suggested that farmers bargain collectively as other people do. And uh, this certainly would be part of, the, part of the answer. And then the third part should grow out of that, that we're going to have to bring our farm groups together. We have to have cooperation from all of the major farm organizations. And I, there's no reason in the world why this can't be possible, why we can't uh, do this. Uh, we're dealing with, with uh, good people, reasonable people, I think. And there's no reason why we can't accomplish this fact, that, uh, to bring them together. But it's something that we, we have to quit talking about it, and we've got to do something. This reminds me, of a, again, of an illustration. But there, we've talked ever since I was a little kid. I can remember them saying, we've got to get together. Farmers just got to learn to stick together. That's, this is all there's to it. And it reminds me of a group, perhaps, in battle. And the, there might be 25 soldiers, and they're outnumbered. And every morning, the lieutenant gets up and says, now, we've got to get together. We've got to get organized to defend ourselves. But they never quite make it. And by night, two or three are dead. And the next day, he gets up and he pounds the table and he says, we've got to get together. And by night, two or three more are gone. Until pretty soon, there, there aren't any left. They, there's no need for organization. There isn't anything left there. And uh, so we have to, to bring these organizations together somehow, some way. And certainly, there, there has to be, I'm convinced there has to be a way that we can do this simply by, we have to start by talking and to cut out this foolish fighting we can afford to fight. Well, that, is for, that is for sure. We can no longer afford to fight. Uh, we've yeah. definitely got to get together if we're going to accomplish what has to be done. Uh, some of these people uh, still don't feel they can get involved, but... Uh, this reminds me of a story <laughs> that I heard the other day that... Uh, to this man, I'm sure it wasn't very funny, but he was a victim of, of some robbery. And when they were asking him how it happened, he said, uh, well, he said, I got out of my car and some thug hit me in the head and another one kicked me, he said, and the third one took my wallet. And they said, well, what did you do? Well, he said, I just I laid there. He said, I didn't do anything. They said, you mean you, you didn't fight back at all? He said, no, I didn't. And they said, well, why not? Well, he said, I just didn't want to get involved, you know. <laughs> And I think a lot of times, perhaps, we have a lot of people that uh, don't want to get involved. So, uh, for what reason, I don't know. But the, uh, there are, uh, the need for all of us to get involved in this, which I consider a very Christian work uh, to uh, develop a kind of agriculture in America that can feed not only this nation, as it certainly has in the past, and so we, our way of farming has proved itself to be good, but to feed as many people in the world as possible. Well, that is right. Uh, there are so few areas in the world left who can feed more than their own people. And the United States is one of the three, probably. Uh, so we definitely have a duty. We've got to find some way that this can be accomplished. Uh, I think if the industry was healthy, uh, I think we uh, would be in a position if, uh, if we once have this industry down as a business that we can go to our government and uh, tell them that we're in a position to grow more food. Uh, there are plenty of people in the world who could use it. Uh, on the other hand, our own people can well afford to pay full price for that food that we raise for them. However, every time we uh, raise just a little bit more than they need, you uh, penalize us and lower the price on all of our production. Isn't there some way that we can feed this hungry world and still make a living at it? Well, not only is there, there has to be a way. The Holy Father, in his last letter to the Christian people, talked about the haves and the have-nots. And he uh, cries about the fact that there are so many people. And I'd like to picture uh, and I think this could have happened, I'm sure it did, in the uh, uh, Vatican Council. But suppose our, a bishop from our area, say our own bishop uh, from our own diocese, uh, were to sit down at a table next to, say, a bishop from India, 
And uh, our bishop might say, you know, I come from a rural diocese, and the biggest problem my people have is overproduction. You know those people just produce so much that they drive their price down, and this is, at least this is what they're told is their problem. They, they, they raise too much. And could you imagine how that other bishop from India might have felt when he'd have to say, you know, the big problem in my diocese is that most of my people go to bed hungry. Uh, many of them are starving to death. And you say your problem is too much. Now, I think this illustrates the unchristian attitude that we have here. And that we can go on and pretend like it doesn't exist or it doesn't, that there's nothing to it. These are real people that are starving to death. These are real people that, that need help. Now, how, you might say, are you going to accomplish this? If we're smart enough in this country, I always think, to put a man on the moon, then no one can ever convince me that we're not smart enough to put food in the stomach of a starving man without upsetting anybody's economy. It's, it has to be done. It can't be that complicated. We don't want to do it. And I think that the farmer has to realize that he has the food first. And if, if it's misused, we can, it's easy for us to you know, sit back and criticize Washington and say, well, why don't they feed the hungry world? What's the matter with them? Or uh, the processors or those people in between. But who had the food first? I bought a car some time ago and uh, had trouble with it. And with one sentence to the fact that I was unhappy with this particular car brought a telegram from Michigan and a long distance call from the branch office out of Minneapolis asking me what was the matter, what did I want done. They were concerned. Now, they could have easily said, well, now, that's the dealer's problem, you know that. We've been paid for our automobile. Uh, but this is not the uh, dealer's problem, uh, or it's not, it, it, it's his problem, because if, if we don't buy another car, it, he had the car first and he felt responsible. And the farmer, the same way. The farmer has the food first and he is responsible. And if there are hungry people in the world, perhaps farmers, if they were uh, agriculture, if it was organized, if all farmers were organized, they could go to the government. And this, I can't see why this couldn't work. And say, now, we could conceivably produce that much surplus this coming year. Now, are you willing to take this off our hands as a wealthy nation and use it as food for peace, as we hear about, if you are, we'll be glad to raise it. If not, of course, we, we can't afford to uh, back this uh, finance, uh, finance this thing completely ourselves. But if the American people are willing to, we'll raise it for you. Now, if they were organized, they could do that. But not being organized, so whose fault is it? Whose fault really is it that there are hungry people today? Can the farmer, can we, as those who live in rural America, completely <coughs> excuse ourselves and say it's Washington, it's a process, or it's someone else? Or don't we have to take a little blame ourselves and say, perhaps we haven't run our own business uh, quite as well as we should have? Well, I think very possibly that uh, we, we can be blamed. Uh, I had never thought of it in that uh, particular light before. I do know that uh, NFO has said that once we were in a position to price our product, we would be in a position to uh, take care of any surplus that would develop through our surplus disposal fund. And I do know that uh, getting that production out of the normal market channels was part of the ambition. Well, this, this would program. be wonderful if they can. And that's where it would fit in. And organized, I think, farmers can do this. Because we have always felt that uh, we should not be penalized because we raise just a little bit more than what our people in this country could use of right. uh, Especially in view of the fact that others need it so badly. Right. And there was a place in a hungry world for it. I do notice uh, some of the press releases that have been following Mr. Freeman as he's been traveling around the country uh, have led me to believe that it's very possible that we will be able to get soon these groups of people, these groups of farmers, uh, together. I noticed the, uh, some of the Tribune articles yeah. Uh, we're speaking a little bit like uh, there was more than just one group there and that they all had just about the same thing to say. And they were all, all realized that they were suffering. I saw these. These were very good. 
Uh, I think it's very possible Mr. Freeman went back to Washington. Uh, well, he went back speaking collective bargaining anyway. He said it, whether <laughs> he believed it, but he, he was hollering it anyway. <laughs> well, that is, that is definitely what we need. We, we have to let these people know what we want. We have to let them know that we understand what mm -hmm. our problems are. And, uh, but we have, I think a lot of these things are in the area of ideas and attitudes, though. Don't you think, Cletus, that, that this is what we're fighting? I'd, I'd like to break this into three uh, sections, uh, three things that rural people will need if they ever hope to organize and to accomplish these tremendous things that they could accomplish if they were organized, such as feeding a hungry world. To me, this is the most Christian work in the, uh, possible to feed. There are, there are literally millions of Americans that aren't eating enough right. uh, as much as they, as they should because they, they can't afford to. And uh, this tremendous Christian work. But I think we have to develop three things. Number one, I think we need some kind of pride in our work. There's no question about the fact that you ask a farmer, what does he do? And he'll hold his head down and say he just farms. You ask anyone else, a priest or minister or teacher or lawyer, doctor, and with justifiable pride, they will explain just what they do to help, the, how important they are in this picture of society. And the farmer, how terribly important he is, he's, uh, that he should have the kind of pride that says, we have done a good job over the years. We'd like to keep it this way. We don't want corporation farming. We don't want someone else to take our job. We've done a good job, and God knows they have. And we intend to continue to do a good job. And this is the first thing. The second is, I think we have to have something that Christ talked about almost uh, without stopping. And that is concern for my neighbor. Now, this can go all the way from the guy across the road to the hungry people in far, the far reaches of the world. And that if I have this kind of concern for my neighbor, that I will want to help the man across the road, if I can, uh, to stay in business. I will work with him. I'll cooperate with him. And trying to cooperate with him so I can raise more to, put, to feed these people that haven't got it so good, huh? these poor people. And um, to develop this kind of concern, this honest concern uh, for, for someone else. Uh, the attitude, as one man said not too long ago, told me, we're talking about the low prices of cattle and hogs. Uh, and he said, well, it doesn't really bother me, he said, because I don't have any. And a fine fellow, but this is the attitude, I don't have any. I'm not sick today, so I can't understand why you're sick. Uh, I don't have any pain today, so I, I, I really don't, I don't tell me about yours. I'm not interested. So I don't have any cattle and hogs today, so I don't care what the price is. Instead of realizing that someone else has that product to sell right now and perhaps is hurting because he can't get the price he should. And this type of thinking prevents us from ever working together. We, we've got to develop this concern. We have the greatest Catholics, Lutherans, Methodists, what have you in this country, but I wonder perhaps if we have the greatest Christians. The, and a Christian is someone who has that concern. And this, I think, is what is the place where, where a priest or a minister comes into this thing, is to develop these kind of things, to develop Christian attitudes. And then the third one would be a willingness to sacrifice for a cause. Now, farmers, I don't think, have ever sacrificed. They've had a lot of things taken away from them. But I, I, I really question whether they've ever honestly uh, sacrificed in the sense that I give up something that I could keep today. Well, they have. They, they have. They, they've sacrificed their neighbor. This, uh, we, we've always been great for this. You know, when they, when they say you have to expand, we look on both sides of us and say, well, how about, how about you? You'd, you'd be the one, that, uh, the best one to, to go, and then the next one is someone else. There isn't anything that's ever been worthwhile anywhere in the world that wasn't accomplished through sacrifice. Selfishness will always destroy itself. Always destroy itself. And sacrifice will accomplish in time. But we're going to have to be willing to give up 
time, energy, money in order to accomplish this. And if we had these three attitudes, if I had enough pride as a farmer in my work to say, I want my son to do what I have done. I'm proud that I'm a farmer. I have done a real good job and I want the nation to, to continue this way of life. Then I have enough concern that I want everybody else that's farming to be successful, if it's at all possible. And then I'm willing to make a sacrifice to bring about. If I think that family type farming is important, then I have to make a sacrifice. So I think these three things are terribly important. Well, Father, they sound like the three answers to me. Uh, I thought that I was always proud of my work. I have been. I like to do a good job if I can. And when I do accomplish something, I, I am justifiably proud of it, I think. But nevertheless, I often wondered, especially over the last five, six years, uh, I have some boys at home. And I've been trying to show them how I'd like to have them do this job or that job that I give them. But in the back of my mind, I question the fact of whether they would be making a wise decision well, should they take up the agriculture as an occupation. Not because it isn't a worthwhile job, not because it isn't important. Uh, I think we are producing a product that people need three times a day. I think these, I'm, I've mentioned this before, that I think you're, they need food before they need a doctor. You're terribly, the, the farmer is important, there's no question. But of course, it's been a, it's been a rugged game, and right. uh, that is the reason we don't uh, tend to ask our sons to take up our profession. We have a little thing in this, in this country of ours called rugged individualism. You mentioned the rugged game, which is a nice way of saying that someone is very, very selfish. Uh, that I made it, and so can you, and if you can't, too bad about yeah. it. Uh, this is a, uh, one of the, the serious problems, I think, and uh, it's against Christianity anyway, this rugged individualism. Well, Father, I see our time is presently up. I want to thank you very much for taking time off from your busy schedule to be with us here today for Midwest well, Farm Report. Thank you for having me.